Well, good afternoon, my dear brethren and sisters in our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've been treated to two really lovely items today, haven't we? And I've been really impressed with them, and particularly with uh, the children up there singing so well. That's really lovely indeed. I also want to, as uh, this is our final study together, to uh, express the thanks of Sister Wendy and I for the warm welcome that you've given us and uh, the abundant hospitality. Thank you. We've been quite overwhelmed and it's been very lovely for us. Thank you indeed. Now, this afternoon's study is after a lovely lunch, which was a very nice lunch. Thank you. And uh, I think sometimes this is called the graveyard shift because it's hard to stay awake. So I wish you all the best in staying awake. Um, if you do go to sleep, as long as you don't snore, that's, that's really off-putting. Um, and look, if it gets really bad, we can, also, we can stop and do some star jumps to wake up. How about that? <laughs> okay. Well, we come to what I think is the pinnacle of Jehoshaphat's life. And where we left him chronologically was in 2 Kings chapter 3, when there was the alliance made between Jehoshaphat and Jehoram to go and fight against Moab. And he foolishly made that alliance. And you can see on the map where they went, they went right down to the bottom of the Dead Sea. And they expected to find water there and there wasn't any water because the brook Zered was dried up when it normally is never dried up. And so they looked as though it was going to be the end for them all, perishing with thirst. But Yahweh saved them, didn't he, by a miraculous intervention. And the result of that was that they had victory over Moab. But at the end of the chapter, we read in 2 Kings 3, verse 26 to 27, of the anger of Moab when they had got to uh, siege the city of Kerharaseth and the king actually offered his own son as a symbol of resentment of what Israel had done. And 2 Chronicles chapter 20 is payback time. This is when Moab and Ammon pay Israel back for what they did. So 2 Chronicles chapter 1 and the first three verses, we find that Ammon and Seir also attack with Moab. And you can see the map. Now, this is from the Macmillan Bible Atlas, also now, now known as the, the Carter Bible Atlas. Um, I'm not quite too sure about the route going across the Dead Sea, but um, it would certainly be in one of the shallowest parts of the Dead Sea. But you can see they, they start off from down in the territory of Moab and they end up uh, in the wilderness of Tekoa. And you can see En Gedi is marked there. Now, why did they attack Judah and not Israel? After all, Israel was the initiators of this move to come down and bring Moab back into subjection to Israel. So why attack Judah? In fact, it seems to be that they're singling out Jehoshaphat because in chapter 20, verse 1, it says at the end of the verse, they came against Jehoshaphat to battle. So presumably it's Jehoshaphat is the one that they're blaming for Israel's victory over them in the recent past. Now, like so many trials in life, there isn't a warning. You know, it's not as though God says to us, uh, look, in two and a half weeks time, this major trial is going to overtake you, but don't worry, it'll be all right. What tends to happen with trials, doesn't it, brethren and sisters, is bang, they're suddenly upon you. And you've got to think, what on earth am I going to do now? And that's what it was for Jehoshaphat. You see, verse 2, then, then uh, came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, there cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea, this side Syria. Behold, they are at Hezazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. So the first he knows... This force is in Engedi, maybe two to three days' walk to Jerusalem. And the rest of Judah is also open to attack. This is just terrible, isn't it? And so, such shocking thing to happen. And we're told in verse 3, and Jehoshaphat feared. And I think if I'd been in his shoes, I'd be fearing quite too. I'd be shaking because this is a very, very serious attack. What does he do? Well, we'll see. There's a lesson, actually, in dealing with fear. How do we fear? How do we deal with fear in our lives? Because 
Fear is going to come and it's a natural human reaction. We can resort to our own schemes and perhaps as Jehoshaphat has done a couple of times, seek God's blessing once his scheme is already in place. But this time, Jehoshaphat does it differently. He seeks Yahweh to build faith because you see, as I think we've said before, the thing that conquers fear is faith. That is the only thing. And here's some scripture references. Psalm 56, verse 3. What time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. We overcome fear by faith. Matthew 8, verse 26. And Jesus said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Because their faith wasn't strong enough to overcome the fear, was it? Mark 4, verse 40. Why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? Clear teaching of scripture. Faith overcomes fear. So when we're confronted with a situation where we're fearful, what have we got to do? We've got to build up our faith and dwell on our faith. That's what will get us through, isn't it? Well, dramatic things happen. Dramatic response to what Jehoshaphat had done with bringing the people back to himself. How is their faith going to survive this test? Verse 4, And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of Yahweh. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek Yahweh. Now, if we were living in one of the cities of Judah, perhaps the area of maybe Etam or Tekoa, would we be ready to go up to Jerusalem to go and seek God? Or would we be thinking, hey, this is scary. The enemy's just down the end of the valley at Engedi. If we go and leave our farms and our town, go to Jerusalem, the enemy could be up there in, a, in, a, in just a day or so, and they wipe out everything we've got. So this is a huge test of faith, isn't it? And they responded. They gathered themselves to ask of help of Yahweh. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek Yahweh. Wow, isn't that, that just something? It just thrills your heart. The reformation that Jehoshaphat had done with the people had worked. He'd built up their faith, hadn't he? It was just so amazing. So they come to Jerusalem. Where are they? Verse 5. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah. So he's in the temple. It says it's in the house of Yahweh before the new court. He's not up in some separate place. He, notice he's standing with the congregation of Judah. He's in amongst the people. He's not saying, I'm above you and I'm more important than you. He's saying, I'm just one of you. And he's standing there in the court. Now, he's in the great court, I believe. It says it, it's marked out as being in, uh, in the house of Yahweh before, that is, in front of the new court. The reason it's called the new court is because um, it was the court. I think I've got it here. New court. The new court is the court where the altar was renewed by Asa, and that's in 2 Chronicles 15 and verse 8. So here's this great congregation, many, many thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people in this amazingly large court. And what does Jehoshaphat do? Verse 6, he begins a prayer. He doesn't say, I've got a scheme as to how we can deal with these invaders. After all, we have an army of 1.2 million men, so that's not insignificant. He doesn't say that at all. He doesn't come up with a solution. He does the right thing, doesn't he? He approaches God first. And as we've mentioned several times in our talks, that's something that we've all got to remember to do. When there's a problem, instead of devising an answer, let's go to God first and seek what his direction is. Now, he gives this prayer, and this is an amazing prayer. From verse 5 through to verse 12. Now, undoubtedly, it's a pricey. It's just a summary of what he said, but we can sort of unpack what he said because almost every word he says is drawn from Scripture. Now, think about that. He's got perhaps one day to prepare his prayer. There's no way he could have concocted this from a fresh start to make a prayer like this, which is so full of scripture. It's because he knows it, isn't it? 
He's brought together the threads of things that are similar circumstances, of the promises that God made to Solomon, that when his people cried unto him that he would hear. And it's all here. Now, we're not going to go through all the scripture allusions because there's a heap of them. But we can say that this follows the pattern of the prayers of the godly. You find, don't we? David does this. His prayers are full of quoting scripture. So is Daniel. So is Hezekiah. The structure is the same. It always starts with praise to God. God's glory and majesty are upheld. Never blame God. God is never wrong, so we should never blame God. Never make demands upon God, but instead we appeal to his promises. And we don't tell God what to do to solve the problem. We leave the solution to God. Key principle of prayer. I think this is a very important thing in, in prayers, and I, I think it's being a bit missed these days. Effective prayer comes from effective reading and meditation on Scripture. A relationship with God requires that we listen to his word as well as talk to God in prayer. Now, one of the most beautiful thing is, things is in prayers when brethren can quote scripture after scripture in their prayer. Not that that's the idea of being something that's impressive or to convince other people of how wonderful I am in knowing bits of the scriptures, but rather to weave into it the thoughts of God in the scriptures into our prayers. And there's some pretty straight talking in the Bible about this. Proverbs 28 verse 9. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be an abomination. So the person that is not giving their attention to the law of God and to the word of God, what's their prayer to God? It's an abomination. And when you think about it, Prayer is, a, well, our lives and our, our relationship with God has got to be a two-way communication thing, doesn't it? There's no good us being the one that's doing the talking all the time. That doesn't make for an effective relationship, does it? It's a one-sided thing. So we've got to listen to God and also pray to God. It's got to be a two-way thing. Um, you know, this is emphasised even in the tabernacle of the temple. We find that the offering of incense, which represents prayer, was done when the lamps were trimmed. Exodus 30, verse 7. And Aaron shall burn thereon, that is on the altar of incense, sweet incense every morning. When he dresseth the lamps, he shall burn the incense upon it. You can see the connection, can't you? Incense represents prayer. The lamp represents the word of God and attention to the word of God. So the two things happen together. We can see how it's an important principle. So, key principle for prayer. Effective reading of the scriptures and meditation is a, is a uh, prerequisite. Now we come to Jehoshaphat's prayer. Well, I've got a whole bunch of slides here. We could go for another two and a half hours, but I think you probably don't want to do that. It's a lot of interesting stuff, but I think after an hour or so we might lose interest. Um, so I'm just going to pick a few things out. So there's a whole bunch of slides here. I'm just going to pick out some things. So he starts off, verse 6, Yahweh Elohim of our fathers. You can see, quoting Deuteronomy 26, verse 7. God in heaven, quoting Deuteronomy 4, verse 39. Rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen, and in thine hand there is not power nor might. Again, quoting 1 Chronicles 29, verse 12. But you notice that he acknowledges that the fact that these people have come up, these heathen have come up against him is part of God's purpose because they couldn't do it unless God allowed them to do it. So that means God's permitting this to happen. And that's a very perspective, a very good perspective on this trial, isn't it? When trials happen in our lives, God has allowed that to happen. And if God's allowed it to happen, he's not trying to kill us or destroy us or squash us, what he's trying to do is teach us, isn't he? Now, I think I'll just do the bit about verse 8 at the bottom of the slide because I've got to skip some of this, otherwise we'll be here for a long time. And it says about these nations, sorry, about Israel, and they dwelt therein and have built thee a sanctuary therein for thy name. 
Now, this is quoting Solomon's prayer in 1 Kings 8, verse 20. He does a lot of quoting of Solomon's prayer at the dedication of the temple, where Solomon says, And have built a house for the name of Yahweh Elohim of Israel. Another one. Uh, this time we'll do the one at the top. If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment or pestilence or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And he's quoting, you can see the references up there, 1 Kings 8, verse 36 to 39. And there's a refrain through Solomon's prayer, isn't there? Where he talks about that, Hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. If thy people suffer this or suffer that, then hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place and act. And so he's appealing to God's promise to act as he did at the time of Solomon. So let's do the second last row, verse 12. O our God, wilt thou not judge them? Again, quoting 1 Kings 8, verse 32. Our eyes are upon thee. That's exactly what Asa said, his father, concluding his prayer when he was invaded by a mass multitude. So what a prayer is this, just packed full of scripture and yet with just a marvellously humble attitude, isn't it? He doesn't tell God what to do, but he implores God to be true to his word and to his promises. And just imagine, brethren and sisters, when he stops his prayer. The end of verse 12, but all our eyes are upon thee. And where's all Judah's eyes? They're right on the king because he hasn't given an answer, has he? We're standing here and wondering, what are we going to do? This is one of those dreadfully awkward silences, isn't it? What are the people going to do? And it says in verse 13, and all Judah stood before Yahweh with their little ones and their wives and their children. And you imagine they all got their bowed heads during the prayer. And after the, the prayer finishes, there's silence and people are waiting and waiting. And the tension mounts. Will there be an answer or won't there be an answer? And then the spirit of Yahweh comes upon this man, Jehaziel. And notice who he is of the sons of Asaph. They were the singers, weren't they? They prophesied in, in, in their singing. They were a critical part of the temple worship. And the spirit of Yahweh came upon him. Didn't come upon the king. It came upon a man who's a Levite, the sons of Asaph. Jehoshaphat's quite happy with that. He doesn't get himself upset that the answer came to someone else other than him. He's quite happy with that. Well, then Jehaziel proceeds to give the words of Yahweh, starting verse 15. And he said, Hearken ye, all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou king Jehoshaphat. What does he do? Well, he gets the answer from God. And again, it's quoting scripture. Verse 15. Be not afraid nor dismayed. I'm sure you'd recognize that as one of the statements from Joshua. Be not afraid nor dismayed. For the battle is not yours, but God's. That's quoting 1 Samuel 17, verse 47, David's words to Goliath. Stand still and see the salvation of Yahweh. Exodus 14, verse 13, when Israel was at the brink of the Red Sea. Now getting all upset and worried, Moses settled them down and said, Stand still. You'll, have, you'll be able to do things at a moment. You'll have to go, but for the moment, just wait. For Yahweh will be with you. And that's, that's 2 Chronicles 15, verse 2. So, then we come to verse 21. I think I've skipped something there. Verse 18. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before Yahweh, worshipping Yahweh. So here is Jehoshaphat. He's happy with the answer. God has given an answer. So he's bowed his face to the ground, acknowledging his, uh, his humble position before God. 
And then spontaneously, verse 19, the Levites and the children of the Kohathites get together and they stand up and praise Yahweh. Wouldn't that be amazing? There's just spontaneously um, from these people, the singers, a response to praise God because here is the answer. And verse 20, they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshua, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear, O Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in Yahweh your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, because a prophet just spoke to them, so shall ye prosper. So they're going to go out from the city and they're going to now confront the enemy. How are they going to go? Well, I'm no military strategist, but I would think that the normal received wisdom would be that you send out the crack troops first and then the rest of the army and then the rest of the people behind the army. But as you know well from, from what, what is read here, from our reading, what do they do? They send the singers out first. Now, singers might be well qualified to perform really nice items for us, and we've enjoyed that. But to lead the people at the front? Wow, that's really something, isn't it? And the singers are actually defenceless. They don't have weapons, do they? And also, one of the things about going out to battle, which I have learned, is that most armies, if they're going to go and fight another army and they want a surprise, you try not to make noise. You don't do singing to announce where you are. There's plenty of case studies of the war in Vietnam where the American soldiers didn't really heed this and went along talking at the top of their voices and surprise, surprise, the Viet Cong shot them because they announced their presence, didn't they? And what are they singing? For his mercy endureth forever. This was one of the things that was used in bringing up the Ark to Zion and the dedication of the, the temple. And you know the content is in Psalm 136. You know, that's that, that psalm that we find sometimes difficult to read and when it comes in the daily readings because it's got the refrain in every verse, hasn't it? For his mercy endureth forever. And by the time you've read the 20 verses, our kids used to say, do we have to say it again, Dad? <laughs> Yes, we do. It's scripture. Now, there's something quite interesting here, and uh, I'm a little tentative about making this point because I don't want to uh, upset too many people. Verse 21 says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto Yahweh that they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army. The beauty of holiness. Well, that's not actually a very good translation. There's a principle behind here, and the principle is about dress in worship. You see, the expression, the beauty of holiness, is translated in the RSV, ESV, NASB, and ASV as to praise him in holy array. In other words, to be dressed in holy, that is separate garments, to praise Yahweh. So that's referring to formal dress in worship. And you might think, oh, okay, that's interesting. But this expression to, um, to praise Yahweh in holy array, which is generally translated in the beauty of holiness, occurs other places as well. Same expression in 1 Chronicles 16, verse 29. Worship Yahweh in holy array. Psalm 29, you can see it, Psalm 96. So it's not an isolated quote. There's other quotations saying the same thing, isn't there? And there's another thing related to the principle. You might remember that when Israel came out of Egypt and they came to Mount Sinai and God said to Moses, now the people are going to have to come and you know, give them three days time. They're to appear before me before the mount and... They're to wash their clothes before they come. You might say, well, that doesn't say that they had to have nice formal attire. No, but they couldn't have, could they? They were slaves in Egypt and there was no stores at Mount Sinai to go and buy any new clothes. 
So they only had the clothes they had, but they had to wash their clothes. In other words, they had to present the best they could before the presence of God. So I think that's just, to me, it's an important principle of the importance of formal dress in worship as a, as a, a symbol of our representation of honour, giving honour to our God. Well, the story goes on. Verse 22. And when they began to sing and praise, Yahweh set ambushments before the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah. So what they had to do, you notice the sequence? When they began to sing and to praise, God acts, doesn't he? He doesn't set all the ambushments before they start. They have to take the initiative. And it's a dangerous initiative, isn't it? They've got to go out singing and praising, making themselves targets for the enemy before God acts. In other words, they've got to act in faith, don't they? And then God responds. And God organises the enemy to kill each other. You know, that happens occasionally in battles, doesn't it? It happens in the case of Judges 7, verse 22. And you can see on the map where they went. They went down from Jerusalem through Bethlehem, Etam, down to Tekoa, and they came to the wilderness of Tekoa, and they were told that the enemy was in the wilderness Jeriel. You can look at the territory there. It's not exactly the nicest territory, and you can't sort of hide amongst the trees, can you? Because there ain't no trees, which means no matter where you are, you're pretty visible. So to go down there was to go down by faith, by faith and faith alone. So there's another key principle, another key lesson. Salvation by faith. Yahweh does the saving, but we are to show faith and obedience. We've got to take the initiative. We see the saving arm of Yahweh, of Israel at the Red Sea. Gideon with his 300 men. David killing Goliath. The angel that killed 185,000 Assyrians. He provides Jesus Christ for our redemption. Big question. Do we trust that Yahweh can save us out of of our problems? Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? When we have what seems to be problems that are intractable and we can't find an answer. And sometimes the problems aren't just a problem for a day or two. They might be for months or years. But can God save us out of our problems? He can. Romans 8 verse 31. If God be for us, who can be against us? Important principle for life. Salvation is by faith. Well, we know from verse 23 that the inhabitants went and slew each other. The children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to destroy, slay and destroy. And when they'd made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, everyone helped to destroy another. And you can just imagine the scene, just bodies everywhere as they got out of control, just killing any person that came in their sight because they thought that was the enemy. And the battle's done. And verse 24, they came towards the watchtower in the wilderness. They looked on the multitude and they're all dead. And Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil. And they found riches in, a, um, in abundance with the dead bodies and precious jewels, etc. And they spent three days spoiling all the bodies. And it wouldn't be just the bodies because they would be traveling with their packs, with tents, and there'd be things in their tents because it seems that when they fought wars in those days, they took a lot of the precious things with them. Partly the reason for that is that if you're confident that you're going to take over the enemy's territory, when you get there, you need to have some things to be able to buy whatever you need to set yourself up, etc. So apparently that's part of the reason they used to take a lot of wealth with them. So the Moabites had lots and lots of riches, didn't they? But it didn't save them. And it never saves us. Now, being the richest man in the graveyard is absolute foolishness. And there's a lesson in that. Let's not chase the riches of the world, but let's instead be rich towards God. 
Well, verse 26. And on the fourth day, what do they do? They assembled themselves in the valley of Berakar. They could have gone home, couldn't they? Once you've spoiled all the, all the bodies and all the tents, taken everything you want, the enemy's gone. Hey, we can just be out of here. Go back home. And we've made some money out of the exercise. But they don't. They assemble themselves in the valley of Berakar. What do they do? They bless Yahweh. So they got together in this valley and they stopped to praise God and to thank God. But they didn't just stop there, did they? They actually went back to Jerusalem. Verse 27. Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem and Jehoshaphat, in the forefront of them. So Jehoshaphat's leading, he's leading this example, to go again to Jerusalem. So they're going to go back to the temple for for Yahweh had made them to rejoice over their enemies. Verse 28, they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets and they praised God. They said, thank you. Now, when you look at it, the enemy was destroyed somewhere around in the valley of Berakar, near Tekoa. For many people, it would have been much easier to just go straight home. And again, they didn't take that alternative, did they? Instead, they go and praise Yahweh. Wow. Isn't that really something? So what a finale. They end up at Jerusalem. And the people of, of Judah are praising God in the temple. Verse 28. The spiritual reformation has worked, hasn't it? They have shown real faith and also they have given thanks at the end, haven't they? Something that we all need to remember to do. When Yahweh delivers us from our trials, we must remember to thank our God, mustn't we? And then we come to the conclusion, so verse 30, so the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. What an amazing conclusion that is to the life of Jehoshaphat, isn't it? Everything has gone well. Things have been turned around. He's made the people faithful to God. They've gone through a trial to have tried faith and they've passed that trial. They've put their faith in God and now it's all peaceful. And verse 29, And the fear of God was upon all the kingdoms of the, of the countries when they heard that Yahweh fought against the enemies of Israel. So they've now got peace. Wow. So this is it for the end of the life of Jehoshaphat. What a great way to finish his life story. Well, let's summarise some of the, uh, the key lessons. Moab invades Judah. That was the consequence of the foolish alliance that Jehoshaphat had made with Joram, wasn't it? Our sins may be forgiven, as I think I've said several times now, but sad consequences can still flow. Jehoshaphat feared the invading army, so he set himself to seek Yahweh. Principle, faith conquers fear. Now, if you don't remember anything else in this talk, the thing I'd like you to remember is faith conquers fear, because that's a principle for life that we can apply when we're fearful. Jehoshaphat's prayer was effective because he drew on scripture and, div and the divine etiquette of worship. Prayer and Bible study are both required. Always talking to God and never listening doesn't make a relationship. The singers go before the army in faith to worship and praise Yahweh. We should face our problems in faith with Yahweh's praise in our, in our hearts. The singers are formally dressed for worship. Formal dress is appropriate for our worship of Yahweh. The miraculous victory when they began to sing, the enemy killed themselves. Yahweh has always done the saving, hasn't he? It's not us that do the saving. Our role is to show faith and obedience. And finally, Judah praised and thanked Yahweh for the victory at Berakar and at Jerusalem. And we should remember to thank Yahweh when he answers our prayers. And so we come to the final, final words. And isn't it wonderful to see the final things of Jehoshaphat all about faith and worship of God an honouring of God. It's a wonderful way to leave this great man 
who sought Yahweh with all his heart.